Bloating isn't just a minor annoyance. It can be painful, leaving you feeling heavy, sluggish, and even ruin your social plans. And unless you know the root cause, it's very unlikely that you will ever truly fix it. It will just keep coming back. Now, if we haven't met before, I'm Maria and I'm a registered dietitian that specializes in gut health. And I have helped hundreds of people fix their gut issues, including my own. And today we're getting to the bottom of yours too. I'm going to share 22 possible reasons why you might be bloated so you can finally feel like yourself again. Now it's common to experience some bloating throughout the day. In fact, it's a sign that your gut bacteria are well fed and they're doing their job. But sometimes it is uncomfortable when it does not need to be. And there are food and lifestyle adjustments that might just do the trick. But bloating can also be a sign that something more serious is going on. So if you start to notice any of these symptoms, you should speak to your doctor. And if you have no other symptoms, but the bloating is very severe, I'd still encourage you to speak to your doctor because extremely painful bloating can be a sign of many other conditions, like endometriosis in women, for example. But today we're gonna to look at the 22 most common triggers for bloating that you can make some adjustments to. And they broadly come under three categories. We have lifestyle habits, dietary habits, and then finally food and food components, because believe it or not, food is not always to blame. So we're gonna start off with the lifestyle and dietary habits. And these are the ones that most people brush off and overlook because they are basic. But if you don't address these, you can probably cut out every food there is and still not get to the solution that you're looking for. The basics really do need to be mastered first. So the first lifestyle habit that I'm going to touch on is exercise. And this is gonna surprise a lot of people because typically we do associate going for a walk, doing some exercise as a method to help with bloating. And it can but there are broadly two types of exercise. You have your low to moderate, which can help excess gas diffuse out and reduce bloating, but you also have the high intensity exercise, like the long runs, the training for a marathon, or the high intensity workouts especially if they're of a longer duration, they can contribute to bloating. Now they obviously have many benefits to your health, but knowing this might help you identify your trigger. So if you were doing high intensity exercise or exercising for a long duration, like over 60 minutes, for example, your body now has to direct the blood flow away from your gut and towards your working muscles. And if this is for a long duration, like running a half marathon, this can cause stomach upset, commonly known as runner's trots. I'm gonna pause here and ask that if you're enjoying the video so far, I would really appreciate it if you hit the red subscribe button below. Plus, I'm gonna have a follow-up video soon where I go over practical strategies to help reduce your bloating. So if bloating is a trigger for you, you don't want to miss that one. And if you're looking for healthy, high protein recipe ideas, I'd recommend following me over on Instagram. Now the next bloating trigger here is a funny one, but one that we are seeing so much more often, and it is wearing tight clothes, especially tight around your waist. In the medical world, we actually have a term for this now. It's called tight pants syndrome. And because it is compressing your stomach and your intestines, the pressure can trap gas and make you feel bloated and uncomfortable. So as tempting as it might be when you're on holidays to wear a nice fitted outfit, or to wear your gym leggings around the house every day, sometimes opting for something a little bit looser can give your digestive system that room that it needs to function. And then we have stress. When you are stressed, your body goes into fight or flight mode and it prepares our body to do just that, to fight. So it floods our system with adrenaline and cortisol. Again, increasing blood flow to your legs and to your arms and away from your working gut because your body is more interested in getting ready to run away from that threat than it is in trying to digest your dinner. And in today's very busy and stressful world, this can be a big trigger for a lot of people. The opposite mode is rest and digest. This slows us down and it prioritizes blood flow instead to our digestive tract and our internal organs. So really we want to be in rest and digest mode as much as possible. Now moving on to dietary habits. One of the big ones that I see is the speed at which you are eating. When you eat too quickly, you are more likely to swallow air. And that air can get trapped inside your digestive system, which makes you feel bloated and uncomfortable. Plus, eating too fast doesn't give your body enough time to signal to your brain that it is full, leading to overeating, which is also going to make you feel bloated and uncomfortable. So you really need to try and slow down and take your time when you're eating to give your body time to properly digest your food. 
Then we have meal timing. And many people think that skipping meals when they feel bloated will be helpful. But it is often the opposite because small regular meals help keep your digestive system running smoothly. But what can be helpful is to try not to eat late at night. Ideally, you want to have your dinner or your evening meal at least three hours before you go to bed. Because when you lie down flat, you are more likely to hold onto trapped gas in comparison to when you are walking and standing around. This way, gas naturally diffuses out. So avoiding big evening meals can be helpful. And also, you have these gut bacteria inside in your large intestine and they help work to digest your food. But interestingly, we know that they have a circadian rhythm too, and they also need to get sufficient rest and sleep every day. And every time you do eat, you do disturb them because then they have to get to work digesting the food. So on the opposite side of things, if you're eating too frequently, like you're snacking all day long, you're grazing into the night and you're having a really early breakfast again the next morning, your body and your gut are never really getting a break and that is not helpful either. So it's a happy medium. Ideally, you want to have at least an eight hour gap for your gut to get some rest every night. For me, what I find beneficial is leaving a 12 hour gap. So I know if I have breakfast at 8 a.m., I try to finish eating at 8 p.m. that evening. I don't do it all the time, but when I can, I do. Then we have the environment that you're in when you're eating. This plays a bigger role than you would think. If you're stressed, distracted, or eating in a rush, it can really mess with your digestion. And even your posture, you shouldn't be slumped over your desk. So eating in a calm, relaxed environment, avoiding your phone, avoiding your laptop, and making sure that meal times are prioritized and peaceful, this can be really helpful. And honestly, sometimes all you need to do is tweak these dietary habits and these lifestyle habits. You don't even need to look at your food. Please don't overlook these basic ones because they are in your control. It's also good to think about the location of your bloating because this can tell us potentially what the trigger is. If you experience bloating in your mid abdomen, for example, this is more likely to be connected to what you eat rather than how you eat. So the next section might be a little bit more helpful. So now we're going to move on to the actual foods. And this can be difficult because it's often more than just one food. It can be a combination of different foods together. So I always recommend my clients to keep a bloating diary, write down your symptoms when they occur, what you have eaten, and also any of those dietary and lifestyle habits that have occurred around those times. That way you might be able to pinpoint what is your specific trigger. And if you can't, because it is difficult, I'd recommend considering working with a dietitian because we really are food detectives. And please remember that with stuff like this, you should never be cutting out whole food groups unnecessarily and keeping them out of your diet forever because you might be leaving yourself nutritionally vulnerable in other areas. Also, what is so important is that it is often the dose that makes the poison. I'm gonna use myself as an example. I know that caffeine can be a trigger for me. If I drink too much, I will get bloated, but I can still enjoy my caffeine. I just know that if I'm gonna have a third cup, I might need to be loosening my jeans later on. So remember that it's the dose that makes the poison. It doesn't mean that if you identify a bloating trigger and it's something you really love that you need to completely cut it out, it might just be moderating the portion sizes or the frequency that you have that food. But in terms of food components, there are three main triggers, lactose, polyols, and fructose. So let's dive in and simplify these. So lactose is a common enough one, and lactose is your milk sugar. So it's found in your milk and your soft cheeses, but it's very low in your hard cheeses. It's not all dairy. But interestingly, 95% of people with African or Asian backgrounds, by the age of 20, they don't produce much lactase. But on the other side of the scale, us Irish people, we grew up on dairy farms and drinking milk. Well, I did anyway, not all Irish. But our bodies did not switch off the gene to stop producing lactase. So most of us can tolerate it very, very well. So there's a huge genetic and geographical link to lactose intolerance. But it is one of the easiest ones to identify if it is a trigger for you, because usually you will get symptoms within five hours if you do have something like too much milk. But what I will say is if you do identify it as a trigger, you don't need to cut it out completely. And doing so again could actually be harmful. It will make you even more intolerant to it. Keeping in just small amounts, because you should be able to tolerate small amounts, will help train your microbes to help you tolerate it better. Or you could also take a digestive enzyme of lactase to help you digest the lactose. So then we have polyols, and you may have heard of them as sugar alcohols, and they commonly end in all. They're found most often in things like your chewing gum, your protein bars, your protein powder, your sugar-free chocolate, and your sugar-free biscuits. 
and they're also in some foods naturally, like mushrooms, for example. But they often come under many different names. So I'll leave a list of them on the screen here now for you. And this is what you should be checking the ingredient labels for. And then we have fructose, which is found in your fruit and in your honey. And by no means am I telling you that you can't eat fruit. That would not be advisable as a dietitian. It's more about spreading out your load throughout the day. Or there are also some digestive enzymes that you could consider in this situation. But take, for example, you went out for dinner and you had melon as a starter. Then you had a main with some fruit like an apple and pear and walnut salad. And then you had a fruit salad for dessert. That's a lot of fruit all in one sitting and that might cause you discomfort if you are sensitive to fructose. However, if you had melon at 8 a.m. in the morning for breakfast, you had more fruit in the middle of the day at lunch, and then you had a snack of berries and yogurt before going to bed, you're probably going to be fine because it's nicely spread out. But being able to identify this is very beneficial because again, if you don't know what your trigger is, it's going to be very difficult to get on top of your bloating. The next category is gut stimulants. And these are foods that stimulate the gut. And the first one is high fat foods. And this is both healthy fats like your olive oils and your avocados, and your unhealthy fats like your fried chicken. But for people who have sensitive guts, the fat can make your gut even more hypersensitive. Fat can also end up stopping some movement in your stomach so you retain more of that gas and it's harder for it to escape. High fat meals also take longer to digest, which can slow down the movement of food through your digestive tract, which can lead to bloating. And if you're really struggling with high fat foods, it might be a sign that something else like bile acid malabsorption is going on. And working with a dietitian can help you fast track whether or not this is occurring and help you get to that diagnosis sooner so you can start managing it and getting to the bottom of things. Then we have caffeine, which again is a stimulant. It can push things through the gut faster. But for sensitive people, it can also irritate the gut. Your tea and your coffee are big ones, but many people don't realize that you can get caffeine in things like your green tea, your chocolate, and in a lot of cough and flu medications. Then we have alcohol, which is quite self-explanatory, but again, this is a stimulant for the gut and it can irritate the gut lining in people who are particularly sensitive. Also chili, this is another gut stimulant. And we all have chili receptors throughout our intestinal tract. And some people will have more of these receptors. And in fact, people with IBS do typically have more of these. So it's another one to keep an eye on and notice if there's any patterns between eating a lot of foods with chili in them and occurrences of bloating. Carbonated drinks are another big trigger for people who suffer with bloating, especially if the bloating is higher up around your breastbone because the carbon dioxide in these drinks does not always get released before it reaches your stomach. So it can get stuck and make you feel bloated. And for every cup, so around 250 mils of carbonated water, this actually produces 900 mils of gas. Now, a lot of people can just burp that up and they won't even notice. But for some people, that burping reflex isn't as strong and that's where they get issues. Then we have foods that are linked to our gut bacteria. So fermented foods and probiotics. I have linked these two together because their mechanisms are similar. So the probiotic might be your liquid or your capsule. And the fermented foods are things like your sauerkraut, your kimchi, and your live yogurts. And these are generally really good for gut health because they're packed with microorganisms, which help support digestion. However, for some people, especially those with a sensitive gut, like an IBS, fermented foods can actually lead to bloating because the fermentation process produces gas. And when you consume these foods, this contributes to excess gas in your digestive system. And that causes that uncomfortable bloating feeling. So if you notice that you experience bloating after eating these fermented foods, it might just be reducing down the portion size. Your body will then get used to it and you can start to build it back up. But if you find that even one to two tablespoons of these fermented foods sets off your bloating and other foods such as spinach or tomatoes and canned fish, for example, also are a trigger for you, it could actually be indicating that you have something called a histamine intolerance. But again, a dietitian would be able to help you pinpoint this because we're food detectives. Now, a lot of people will appreciate that salt attracts fluid. So if you eat a lot of salt, you can get water retention and that of course is gonna to lead to bloating. But we're now starting to understand that there is that short-term bloating, but there's a longer-term impact of having a lot of salt in your diet in terms of bloating too. So a high salt diet can impact how your digestive enzymes work and this can lead to more malabsorption. So then the bacteria in your large intestine have more food to eat and they then produce more gas leading to bloating. And it can also change your gut microbiome in a negative way. Then we have artificial or low calorie sweeteners. So because they are low in calories, they don't get absorbed in the small intestine. So typically they make their way to the large intestine. And this is where most of our gut bacteria live. And because they manage to get this far, 
our gut bacteria start to eat them, producing more gas. And for some people, not everyone, we don't know why, studies suggest that too many artificial sweeteners can change your gut microbiome in a negative way. Now moving on to fiber, and this is a big one. And it's a bit of a paradox because we are told that fiber is great for our gut. But if we have too much fiber, we also start to feel quite bloated. So there are three things that we need to look out for here. The first is that spread of fiber across the day or the week. So in terms of fiber spread, I want you to think about your gut microbes, kind of like us in a way. If you don't feed them, they get hangry. Similarly, if you feed them too often, that gives them a lot of work to do. And they might get a bit annoyed. So you want to give them regular, but not too frequent amounts of fiber. Also, day to day, you want to be consistent enough with your fiber intake. Think of it like binge eating. If you starved yourself Monday to Friday, and then on Saturday and Sunday, you eat loads of fiber, your gut bacteria go from having nothing to absolutely loads, and they go a little bit crazy. So try to start gradually bringing fiber into your diet and try to keep it consistent enough day to day. Then we have the type of fiber because there are over 100 different types of fiber and they all get fermented or digested by our gut bacteria in different ways. And there are certain types of fiber called prebiotics, which again, we generally think of as good for our gut because they are, but they can be a bloating trigger for many because they tend to ferment quickly and in doing so they can create pockets of gas. While this is fine for some, if you have a sensitive gut and you can't effectively move gas along your gut lining, it gets trapped in your gut and it can trigger bloating. Some of the most common ones we see are fructans and these are found in wheat, which is a big trigger for many. And people will often think that it is gluten or bread that is triggering them. But in fact, it's actually the fructan that you have in wheat. Legumes, beans, and pulses also contain these fructans. And then we also have prebiotics in onions, garlic, and cauliflower, which can be a big trigger for many as well. But again, it's not about cutting out these triggers. It's about identifying them and then figuring out ways to work around this. So lastly, we have the fiber amount, because as I've mentioned, it really is the dose that makes the poison. People often hear that fiber is good for them. So they suddenly try to add loads into their diet. And this doesn't give your gut time to adjust. But the good news is that your gut is really adaptable. And over time, by eating lots of plants and having lots of variety in your diet, you can improve your gut microbiome. And what this means is it becomes more diverse. So you have a much broader range of species living inside in your gut. And each species has its own merits. Some are better at digesting certain foods over others. But if you have a wide variety of these gut microbes, you're more likely to be able to digest well a wide variety of foods. So on this note, I just wanna highlight again that if you do find a certain food or foods as a trigger, you want to be careful about cutting out too many things, especially about cutting it out long-term because variety is important and your microbes do need it. Typically, if you're working with a dietitian, what we would often do is if there is something that we think is a trigger, we will ask you to cut it out for a number of weeks. Then if things improve, it is likely that that food was in fact the trigger. But to really double check if this is the case, we'll ask you to bring it back in. And then it's about maybe finding the dose that you can tolerate. So you don't need to remove things forever. Now bloating is crappy. And hopefully this video has helped you identify what might possibly be a trigger. I did cover a lot today, so please comment below with any questions but make sure that you are subscribed because I'm going to do a follow-up video where I cover more of the solutions around navigating these triggers. And if you enjoyed this video, you're definitely going to enjoy my anti-inflammatory diet video too. I'll leave it on the screen here if you want to watch it next, because that is an eating pattern that will also really help improve the diversity of your gut microbiome. And as a thank you for making it all the way to the end of the video, I have a free recipe ebook, which I've linked in the description box below. Thank you very much for watching. Stay happy and healthy, and I'll see you again next week. Thanks for watching.